Find Proverbs chapter 31, Proverbs 31. I'll read verses 10 through 31 in a bit. Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. Glad to see all of you here this morning. It's good to see you and uh, happy Mother's Day to you. A uh, little odd, needing to talk about my father on Mother's Day, but um, he's doing really, really well. And uh, we appreciate your prayers so much. He's still in the hospital, but anticipating uh, being back to Bowling Green in two or three days, perhaps something like that. And uh, really pretty remarkable. Uh, I told you that lead from his pacemaker had punched through the wall of his heart. Uh, the surgeon got in there and uh, started looking for that lead. He was gonna, he was gonna cut it off and uh, he couldn't find it. And then he found the hole where it had been Apparently, when uh, you got to manipulate your insides a little bit to do a surgery like that, so in the manipulation, apparently the lead just kind of pulled back where it belonged. So he stitched the hole, and there you go. So anyway, we never dreamed of anything quite that uh, good. Uh, he's doing he's doing well. So just so incredibly grateful for your prayers for him. And we're, uh, we knew we might lose him, and we were bracing ourselves for the prospects, but. Grateful the Lord's uh, left him with us a while longer. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, preaching Proverbs 31 on Mother's Day is, is dangerous. And uh, uh, mothers, I want you to know that uh, I don't preach Proverbs 31 to um, uh, afflict your tender consciences <laughs> at all. Uh, in fact, I hope uh, the Lord will do something uh, other than that with you and encourage you by what he says here. I, I get it that the standard is really high. It's scripture. <laughs> the standard of scripture is always high. Uh, but I hope, hope to be able to provide uh, more than just affliction to you this morning from Proverbs 31. Um, uh, it, I think, encourages our honor. Uh, to give it where it's due. And, uh, and so I want to encourage the mothers to do your best to enjoy what God has said rather than feel condemned by it. And, uh, and as, we, uh, as I try to preach it, let's remember we have a great Savior who uh, overcomes all our deficiencies and really also also, his grace is not just um, a grace that covers and forgives. It's a, it's a battering ram that breaks down uh, every wall of resistance in our hearts and produces in us what pleases him. And at least from your pastor's perspective, I see him doing that in moms around here in really, really beautiful ways. So uh, thanks for your faithfulness. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to read the text, Proverbs 31.10. If you're able, let's stand one more time. Well, not one more, you'll stand again, but you'll have a pretty good break before we do, I think. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. 
She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are, are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Will you pray with me? Father, we pray that as we peer into this text, into your word, that we will perceive what's here rightly and we will receive it with glad hearts and with faith. And we will give honor where honor is due today. Lord, every one of us began life the same way, coming from a mother's womb. And this is a gift, and we thank you for it. Father, we recognize that Mother's Day is a day of great joy, but it's also a day of great sorrow. So we remember those who would be grieving today, some facing their first Mother's Day without their mother, others remembering mother passed or grandmother passed. Would you comfort those hearts, Lord. There are mothers who've had the horrible duty of burying a child or children. Lord, would you give them special comfort today? And there is a private pain that runs through church families of infertility and childlessness. Lord, would you comfort those in their sorrow? And there is another often private pain of mothers of wayward children whose hearts ache at a child wandering far from you. So all of these that hurt in these ways, Lord, maybe some that I haven't thought of, uh, would you hold them close and give them your comfort uh, as only you can? Um, so Lord, take this word, your word, and drive it into our hearts and beyond our hearts to our hands and our mouths as well today. We love you. We thank you for this opportunity and privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. You can take your seat. This text really is framed in uh, a recognition of the enormous value of an excellent woman. You see at the beginning, an excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. And then at the end of the text, in the other frame, you have this sense of her husband praising her, of um, that she should receive praise in the gates. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. So we're called to recognize that enormous value of an excellent wife at the beginning and then that value is recognized and expressed in praise at the end of the text. So, so this whole text is, is framed. Now, you need to know just a little bit about Hebrew literature and poetry to get this text right. So I'm just going to tell you that, and you can ponder it a little bit, and we'll, we'll move on. Uh, but you, you ought to know it. So this is, a, this is a poem, and it's one of those poems that Hebrews like to do. We don't understand it too well, and we don't do much of it. But there are 22 verses here. Everyone connects with a letter in the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters. And each verse, 10 through 31, starts with a successive letter. So if we were doing it in English, uh, the, the first verse would start with an A. The second verse would start with a B. The third verse would start with a C, all the way to Z. So it's this kind of structure giving glory to this excellent wife. There's also a thing called here a chiasm, and I've described this to you before, but chiasms really have the high point in the middle, and, uh, and, and there are kind of matching ideas moving down from that peak. 
So the middle of this is verse 23. We might talk about that a little bit later. And then it's surrounded sort of near it in two ideas that are similar and then a little further, two ideas that are similar. Just kind of work your way out that way. So you might, I'm not gonna unpack all that for you. I think you might get a little tired of, of the grammar and all that part of it. But I want you to be aware of it. And you might on Mother's Day afternoon or evening just get out your Bible and work through that and see if you can kind of figure the chiasm out a little bit. It might be a blessing to you. So it's kind of the way this is structured. Now, I struggled a lot, not with what I needed to say from this text, because I, I, I think I understand it fairly well, but how to structure the sermon. But this is the way we're going to do it. We're going we're to look at four things, four aspects, and we'll pull things together from the entirety of the, of the poem that way. The first concept is orientation, orientation. I want us to think together what these verses say about the excellent wife's orientation. And you get the most important one and the first one at the end of the poem. And you, and you get it in, in verse 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And when you think about her orientation, I want you to think about it sort of in concentric circles. There's kind of one really close to home and then you kind of work your way out. I think the, the, the poem kind of helps us with that. So... This would be the inner concentric circle, wouldn't it? And that would be that she is a God-fearing woman, a woman who fears the Lord. You might think, well, I'm not sure that's the most important. It doesn't start there. It's at the end, but it's hardly mentioned other than that. I'm pretty sure it is. got to remember what book we're in. We're in Proverbs. How does Proverbs start? Really, the first concept is in verse 7 of chapter 1. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the whole rest of the book really is unpacking what the fear of the Lord looks like. What the fear of the Lord looks like in the way you relate to the world. What the fear of the Lord looks like in the way you relate to friendship and marriage and parenting and work. All of that stuff. It's all, all centered in this orientation to the fear of the Lord. So that's kind of the, the first orientation of this woman's life. And, and I just... I just want to say to you, moms, that um, really to be this kind of woman is, is the best thing you can do for your family. It is, it is more important than anything you will do directly to your husband or for your husband or for your children or for your grandchildren is this becoming a God-fearing woman is the most important thing you can do for then now, the other things matter and we'll talk about those but this is this is crucial it's most important and it starts right here it doesn't mean you live in constant terror of god it does not mean that it does mean that your heart is gripped in awe of his greatness and his goodness and his glory and his wisdom and his beauty and his mercy and his strength. And you just never quite got over the fact that he loved you and saved you and gave you life. You're oriented toward him, first of all. I love the way C.S. Lewis's book, where he grieves the passing of his wife. And uh, he's telling the story of her 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 cancer and losing her to cancer. And the last sentence in the book says, she smiled, but not at me. Now guys, you might not like that. You might think, no, you know, she's got dying. She should be smiling. If she smiles, she should be smiling at me. But C.S. Lewis said, she smiled, but not at me. And the idea is she's smiling at Jesus. He was anticipating. Guys, you're not supposed to be first. <laughs> And you'll be a whole lot better off and you'll be loved a whole lot better if you're not first. If, if you're first, it won't be good and it won't be pretty. So ladies, start there. Uh, orient your life around Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected. Make him the centerpiece and let everything else flow out of that. That's, that's, that's the key. That's the most crucial thing. If you don't get anything else out of, out of Proverbs 31, you should get that. Be a woman who fears 
the, the Lord who lives in awe of his goodness and greatness. And if you're not yet a mom or a wife or any of that, but you hope to be, you're a young woman and you have uh, longings for this kind of life, then I would say start right there. Start right there. Make sure your life is oriented toward the God who made you. And it always is oriented, but until you come under the grace of God in Jesus Christ, the orientation is not one that you would want under the wrath of God because of your sin. Until you repent and believe in Christ, then you come under his refuge and his grace and mercy. And the wrath of God is no longer on you because the wrath of God was absorbed for you by Jesus. Have you experienced that? Have you turned from sin and trusted in Christ? Has your life become oriented to him in the proper way? Repentance and faith and new life in Christ. If not, before I get any further in this Mother's Day sermon, you should just go to him. Right in your heart, right where you are. Just come before him, tell him your trouble, ask him to forgive you. Start relying on Christ, crucified and resurrected. That's, that's the first orientation. Second orientation is toward her household. And you see the word household there a lot. Verse 15, you see it. Verse 21, you see it twice. It's in there in verse 27. So her household. So it starts with the Lord and then it's her household. And her household uh, really relates in a number of ways. One is to her husband. Now, I, I just I have to tell you the truth. I know this flies in the face of modern sensibilities. But when I was talking to you about the chiasm, how the, the pinnacle of the proverb is, is in verse 23. Let's read it. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. That's the peak of this hymn of praise to this excellent wife. And so the pinnacle is her husband. That, I know that is not a popular thing to say in modern days. This is ancient literature, but it's also true literature. And it takes us back really to the very beginning, doesn't it? I mean, where does all of this start in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18? It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then it's near the end of that, verse 24 of chapter 2, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, for the ESV says, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So the woman was created to help and to help her husband to help a man. So this uh, verse 23 being the pinnacle of that, that her husband is an elder and respected in the gate, the fruit of her own ministry to him, uh, is that it's, it's sound biblical theology. The story runs all the way through in that way. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. So she's oriented toward the Lord first, then toward her household within the household, toward her husband uh, it, so we saw verse 23 uh, look at what it says in verse 12 she does him good and not harm all the days of her life good and not harm stated positively and negatively I, I've never found this C.S. Lewis quote uh, but I read Douglas Smith saying C.S. Lewis said this so it sounds like C.S. Lewis to me but he was dra dra drawing this distinction between the, what, between the way men tend to love and women tend to love. And Lewis allegedly said that uh, men tend to love by not giving trouble to people. And women tend to love by taking trouble for people. Y'all are smiling. <laughs> Some of the guys are smiling. You know there's an element of truth to that. And when our wives are not happy with us, we're like, what have I done? I didn't do anything wrong. I'm, not giving you any problems, no trouble. I didn't do this, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do this. Uh, but a woman's love is oriented differently. It's not not giving trouble. I didn't do anything bad. It's taking trouble, taking trouble. And this uh, poem is full of a woman taking trouble for her husband. She doesn't do him harm. She doesn't give him any trouble. But she does him good all the days, all the days of her life. Um, 
So her husband, and then within her household is also her children. They're mentioned late in this, and it says her children will arise and call her blessed. All of this effort you see in the poem is centered around caring for her household. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. So she's invested. When it says that she teaches, no doubt her children are the object of that instruction and that wisdom that you see there in verse 26. So, and then her household though is even more than that. Look at verse 15. It provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. So a household in the ancient world, especially among the wealthy people, involved servants also. So the household was bigger than just kind of nuclear family, husband and children. It might involve grandparents and it often involved servants, which was a wealthy family it always did. And there was a sense of responsibility for all these people within the household. And this woman of this household, uh, she pours out her life for them, for them. And so again, you have this central orientation, fear of the Lord, then a, a wider circle to her household. And then you also see the community, look at verse 20, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. That's beyond the household, isn't it? And yet she's relating to that, she's oriented toward that. And again, verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. So her husband sits with the elders and is involved in the leadership of that community. And so the Lord, then household, then community. So she's invested in all of those areas of life is impacting all of those areas. This may be more indirect than direct in the community as far as the leadership goes, but you better believe she's influencing her husband who's influencing the direction and the flourishing of that community. So she's involved with that. And then I'll add one that's not in the poem, but I think it, I think it ought to be said, and that is the world. That's the world. Not in the poem, and yet it would be implied by the fear of the Lord. So part of what it would mean to walk in the fear of the Lord would, would mean to care about what he cares about. And biblical theology from start to finish all the way through, God cares about all of his creation. He cares about all of the world. And you certainly scattered and created the nations in Genesis 11, but the moment he does that, he's calling out Abram from Ur of the Chaldees, and he's saying, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing, and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so there's this, uh, this, this sense uh, that God cares about all of those that he's made, all those image bearers, all of those nations. And so a godly woman, a God-fearing woman will have an orientation toward the world as well and toward the Great Commission and the, and the coming of the gospel to all the nations. It's crucial that we say that and also want to encourage and comfort a little bit at this, at this point. And that is... We, we focus on Mother's Day on this thing of uh, having children uh, by birth or by adoption. So we tend to focus that way. But in the New Covenant, motherhood has broadened out a bit beyond that. And you might never marry and never adopt and be more fruitful than any woman in the room. And that's just the truth. So read read the biography of Amy Carmichael, uh, that woman who served as a missionary in India and saved hundreds of young girls from prostitution in the temples there. And they were her daughters and they called her mother and she was and is enormously fruitful. I just want to encourage you about that. In the New Covenant, we don't leave all of this behind, uh, but we add to it in that kind of responsibility. So this orientation would be uh, the Lord, and then the household, and then the community, and then the world, and the world. So that's the first thing I want us to think about. The second thing is activity. So first thing, orientation. Second thing, activity. What, what is she doing? And uh, the first thing that really catches your eye, maybe the biggest thing that catches your eye as you walk through this poem, is that she works. And she works hard, and she works smart. So she works hard. And I want to encourage you a little bit that this is, I think some of this is hyperbole. Look at verse 15. She rises while it is yet night. And then look at the end of verse 18. Her lamp does not go out at night. 
So when does she sleep? Maybe in the daytime she gets a nap. I don't know. But, but, but So she, her light doesn't go out at bedtime and all through the night. And then when you get up early in the morning before daylight, she's already up. So when does the girl sleep? I think it's hyperbole. Hyperbole is kind of overstatement to make a point. So, so, so just to comfort you, don't think that you can never go to bed and never sleep. In fact, Susan, I'm so glad I, I had 127 Psalm marked in my Bible to take you at this point in the sermon to take you over there, and Susan already read it. I can't quote it exactly, but the second verse, in vain you eat the bread of anxious toil and stay up late for he gives to his beloved sleep. That's probably not quite the quote, but that's pretty close. It's definitely the gist of it. So how can both things be true? Either she sleeps or she doesn't sleep. No, she, it's, it's hyperbole. She sleeps. You need to get some rest. But the point is what? She works hard. She's a hard worker. And there are sleepless nights with motherhood, aren't there? They come along with it, and sometimes it may be anxiety-driven sleeplessness, and sometimes it may be a baby that needs to be fed, but there are sleepless nights. But it doesn't mean she never sleeps. It just means that she works hard, and you get all of this. Look at verse 13. It works with willing hands. Isn't that good? So why would her hands be willing to work so hard? I I think it's love. C.S. Lewis was right. A woman's love is expressed by taking trouble for people, by taking pains for the people she loves. And I watch you guys do this in a multitude of ways. And it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So her hands are willing because she loves them and she's working hard. And, and what is the working hard for? Well, it it relates to all the orientations we just talked about. She works hard out of her fear of the Lord. She works hard because she loves her husband. She works hard because she loves her children. She works hard because she cares for her household. She works hard for her community. She works hard for the world. It, 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 It relates to all of those circles of orientation. She works hard. But she also works smart. She works smart. Look at verse 16. She considers a field. Look at verse 18. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Verse 14. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. So she's traveling to go get something. She seeks wool and flax. You get this sense not just of great effort, but great excellence, even wisdom in the effort. You can work really hard and not accomplish all that much because you don't work all that smart. So, um, I am not, maybe I shouldn't confess this, it might trouble you a little bit, but I'm not the most efficient worker in the, in the world. I do work hard, but I don't always work all that efficiently. But I'm married to a girl who understands efficiency like nobody's business. And all four of our sons have that going on that, that Lisa brought. That, they don't just work hard, but they, they really work smart. They, they know how to do stuff. We've got, we got, we got sons handling more than I think I could ever stay on top of. It's really extraordinary. I have my hands plenty full with you guys. <laughs> All I can handle, and then some, I think. Um, but I, I marvel at that, and I've marveled all the time. Lisa has helped me be a little more efficient. About once a year, she'll come into my office and... and, and uh, fix it. <laughs> uh, she might need to come in twice a year, but, in, but anyway, um, efficiency. So, so there's this work hard and work smart. And then and the second activity you see here is, is she teaches, she instructs uh, in wisdom and kindness. Look at verse 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. This beautiful kind of play on words here that matches verse 26 uh, and verse 20. Verse 20, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. Verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. So she's a teacher. 
She teaches, she instructs. Now, what does the teaching of kindness mean? And we'll, it's, it's hard to know for sure. It could mean that she's teaching about kindness. So at our house, we've had a, a girl party a couple of times in the last month. Uh, young women have come to our house to watch sort of the newer version of Cinderella. So that's happened a couple of times. And I stayed with them a while in the first one. I went up and said hi in the second one and went to, and went to bed. That was this past Wednesday night, I think. But anyway, they were watching the new Cinderella. And there's this sort of stirring, tear-jerking scene in that newest Cinderella where Cinderella's mom, who's, who's dying, is on her deathbed and she calls Ella to her uh, and, and says, I, I want to tell you something that's really important. And she says, have courage and be kind. Have courage and be kind. So maybe she's teaching about kindness. This is what kindness looks like. You need to do this. Or maybe teaching itself is a kindness when you teach just practical knowledge or when you teach wisdom or you teach instruction from this book. But she, she teaches. Who does she teach? Her daughters and her maidens. And would that be it? I think it's a little broader than that. I think it's a little broader than that. And I love really the way this text, I think, corrects on sort of two excesses. It corrects egalitarians, <clears throat> at least the scripture would. I don't know that Proverbs 31 so it would so much, but the scripture definitely would correct egalitarians who would say there's no roles between men and women. There's no distinctiveness of roles. Women can do anything a man can do. A man can do anything a woman can do. Basic biology teaches us that that's not true. But beyond that, God made us differently in lots of ways. And we ought to be celebrating that. Scripture corrects that. This text, though, corrects an excess in the other direction. A complementarianism, the view that God made men and women different. Uh, but with, and with different roles to complement one another. That's what you see in Genesis 2. But there's a harsh complementarianism that can overstate. It would say, oh no, she only teaches her maidens and her daughters. No, Proverbs corrects that. The very next verse after Proverbs 1 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, the knowledge, of knowledge, uh, the, the man says, Hear your father's teaching, my son, and do not forsake the instruction of your mother. And it comes back to that over and over and over again in Proverbs. And then look at the first nine verses of this chapter. I'm not preaching from that, but, but, but look at them. And what's going on there? It's this woman teaching her son to be careful of a certain kind of woman to not give his strength to women, verse 3, because they destroy kings. It's his mama talking to the king. She's teaching him. She's instructing him. In the scripture, you have this thing of men listening to their wives and it's not too good, you know. Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you not to eat from, Cursed is the ground because of you. So that's the first case. But you also have other cases. You have a guy, Nabal, whose name means fool, who had a very wise wife, Abigail, and he desperately needed to listen to her, and he did not do it. Or you might know a guy named Pilate, whose wife said, have nothing to do with this righteous man, and he desperately needed to listen to her, and he did not. And I would just say, guys, if you have a woman even in the direction of this you'd be wise to hear and often to heed what she says so she teaches and I would just say ladies that you ought to aim at this you ought to seek this to grow in your knowledge of the scriptures so that you can teach and instruct and, and share um, it's the act, activity and then and then there are attitudes here, and we need to go quickly. I just looked at the clock, so just hang on a little while. There are attitudes here. So she fears and doesn't fear. She fears and she doesn't fear. We said the woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So she 
fears, but then, but, but then she doesn't fear. It, it, it says she's, she laughs at the time to come in verse 25. And verse 21 says she is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. So she's fearing and yet not afraid. All her fears are, are, are caught up in this one central orientation so that all the other fears and anxieties and worries kind of melt away in light of the awesome greatness and goodness and strength and mercy of her God. And then, and then she's trusting and trusted, trusting and trusted. So the fear of the Lord would mean, part of what it mean would be she would trust the Lord. It would mean her trust is in him. And I think verse 30 kind of helps us with that. What does it say? Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So women have a temptation. And one of the temptations is to trust beauty and to trust charm. Trust my social adeptness, my ability to navigate relationships and all that. I'll put my trust there. I'll trust my beauty. And you might, it might be embarrassing for me to suggest that that would be the case. But I'm quite confident having pastored women for, I think next Sunday will be 40 years. Um, I... I know there's a temptation, especially with young women, to trust your beauty. And you see it worked out not only in life, but in scripture. But she's not trusting charm and beauty and even her effort or her wisdom. But her trust is in the Lord. But a woman oriented that way and and gripped by that kind of centered on God life, she'll be trusted. The heart of her husband trusts her, verse 11 says then let's go on to application and we'll finish up here so the first thing is is uh is this uh for the women be a woman like this be a woman like this this is a high standard it's it is but also uh there's there's grace in the gospel to forgive any failure along these lines because jesus paid your debt on the cross and repent and believe all that sin is washed away so wherever you are a lot of regret that psalms 31 dredges up in your heart uh, go to christ all of that's forgiven all of that's taken as far away as from the east is to the west and but also the grace of god is bigger than that change and transform and, and grow you up into christ and grow you up into this kind of wife this kind of mother this kind of a woman be this kind of woman second thing for the guys find this kind of woman <laughs> find this kind of woman uh, seek her out search for her unmarried find, find, find her find one uh, you could trust beauty you could go for the trophy wife don't forget what Proverbs eleven twenty two says like a gold ring in a pig snout is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. Teach your sons that. Teach your daughters that too. I don't trust in beauty. Don't go for it. Or, or maybe I should just redefine what a trophy wife is. So a trophy wife would say, it's a wife that I would parade around because of her beauty, like Xerxes wanted to parade around Vashti, right? So that the world could see what I won. Uh, or maybe a trophy wife in heaven's eyes. Maybe a trophy wife in heaven's eyes. What would heaven look on and say is a trophy wife? And Proverbs 31 has given us that. So Lisa caught my eye in the fall of 1978. And she was gorgeous. And I didn't know anything about her except there's a girl. She's beautiful. That was it. And then she showed up in choir. And she was first chair soprano. So she's beautiful. And she's talented. And I was probably just got through the audition because my older brother had been in choir. Probably the only reason I even got in there. At least his first chair soprano. Then she showed up at a prayer meeting. And I was like, okay. <laughs> She's at church on a Wednesday night. Girls don't tend to show up at church on a Wednesday night unless Jesus matters to them. And uh, there she was. So it was game on at that point. I'm slow. But anyway, um, <laughs> the Lord was, was kind to me. 
find, find a woman like this. And, and then thirdly, and related to it, is appreciate a woman like this. And that's much of what Mother's Day is about, isn't it? Appreciate a woman like this. Just think about the women in my life, uh, grandmothers. I have one grandmother I never knew. She died in February of 1931 after she gave birth to my dad and his twin sister. But she gave her life. In a sense, for mine, I wouldn't be here if she hadn't done that. And she gave her life and died giving birth to children. And, and here I am, and a lot of the rest of us are here, uh, blessed by my own mom who passed a little over two years ago, blessed by a sister, blessed by daughters, certainly, certainly blessed by my wife. So appreciate them. Appreciate them. That's what happens in the text. And did, did you notice this is third person all the way through except for one verse. Did you hear that? Verse 29. Many women have done excellently, but you surpassed them all. Everywhere else it's third person. She, her, 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 she, 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 all of that. And then in verse 29, all of a sudden, right after it says her husband also, and he praises her, it's like he does praise her. He, he does it. He speaks to her. Maybe, maybe it's like my wife always sort of rolls her eyes at Song of Solomon when she thinks about Solomon with a thousand wives, writing that about how unique this one woman is when he had a thousand wives. She kind of like, maybe the same thing is going on here if this is from Solomon. But I heard somebody say that they think Solomon wrote these texts late in his life, grieving over his failures and writing them by the Spirit the way it should have. Maybe try that one on and maybe do this. And then finally, orient your life to the only wise king. Orient your life to the only wise king. And that's for men and women and boys and girls. There's only one king. The, the book of Proverbs is about wisdom and Solomon is really, really wise, isn't he? But when you get to the New Testament, Jesus says the queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear Solomon and his wisdom and behold something greater than Solomon is here and Jesus is saying I'm the sage king full of wisdom if you want to know life you orient your life around me and that's the key to all of this any failures are forgiven in his blood all his righteousness is yours. And there really is power in that same blood to make you the mom you always wished you were or want to be, or long to be. It, there's grace abundant to produce all of that in you and all the flourishing you see in this poem through you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what you teach us here. May we take it to our hearts. May our lives be centered on Christ, crucified and resurrected. Would you work in us a great gratitude for those women that have produced life for us and in us. We thank you for each of them. We thank you for how you blessed us by them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together in honor of that wise king.